Job 1, and I want us to illuminate for our critical analysis verses 9 through 12. Job chapter 1, verses 9, 10, 11, and 12. Once you found it, once you say, I got it. Let's read it together. Does Job fear God for nothing, Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has is in your power. But on the man himself, do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the Lord, from the presence of the Lord. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to, uh, I want to preach for a little while today using as a subject, you can start over again. Uh, You can, you can start over again. Look at the person beside you, tell them that's the word I needed. That's... That's the word I needed. You can start over again. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a gross misconception that has been communicated which suggests that it is only the masses trying to make it to the middle class that have problems with money management. In case you haven't gotten the news... Millionaires are suffering too. According to the National Bankruptcy Research Center, the number of affluent that are filing Chapter 11 has increased by 73% over the past year. There are so many million dollar homes on the market with so few people interested in buying them. But even the National Association of Realtors has released that with all the property, hear me, that is presently in stock, that even if no new houses go up for sale, it will take two years to liquidate the present inventory. This year, ladies and gentlemen, this year, 815 millionaires have filed bankruptcy. Just because you have it doesn't mean you can't lose it. What's not widely being discussed is the pressure that led to the painkiller addiction that the King of Pop, Michael Jackson, acquired. Probably one of the most recognizable voices and faces on the planet after a meteoric rise as a childhood star and shattering all records with Thriller, His excessive spending and opulent lifestyle had him facing foreclosure of the Neverland Ranch. Ladies and gentlemen, he was a stone's throw away from filing bankruptcy before his demise. What is not being printed is he was not going on tour for a love of music. He was going on tour as a part of a deal he made with the IRS so that he would not lose everything because of five years of un- or underreported taxes. Marvin Gaye, before his untimely demise, brought the movement to the music by raising the probing interrogative with the timeless classic, What's Going On? Long before, long before R. Kelly, it was Marvin Gaye who introduced eroticism to otherwise covert suggestive lyrics with the groundbreaking ballad, Sexual Healing. But before it is that he found himself on the other end of a gun held by his father, Barry Gordy had problems sending him his residual checks. The reason why they had a problem sending Marvin Gaye his checks is because the last three years of his life, Marvin Gaye was living out of a Winnebago in Hawaii because he had lost his home 
and lost everything. Most notorious of all would probably be Donald Trump. Donald Trump, ladies and gentlemen, has filed for bankruptcy three separate times. Even with his name on buildings and television shows, he was facing utter financial misfortune, forcing the loss of billions of dollars worth of assets. A stained reputation and tremendous humiliation. Hear this, but he was able to regain it all. The critical question that you're now asking yourself silently, although you want to project it out loud, is what is the difference between Marvin and Michael and Donald? The difference, ladies and gentlemen, is Marvin and Michael had gift, but Donald had a strategy. There are a lot of you who are in church who have deluded yourself into believing because you are anointed, you won't go broke. Think because you are gifted, you will not have a rough time because you got a call on your life. You won't no struggle. But the reality is, ladies and gentlemen, you can be gifted. You can be anointed. You can be touched and still lose it all. In order for you to get what it is that God has for you, you have to have a strategy. You have to have a system in place. I want you to write this down as you go into the brand new year. You've got to have a system for your life. You have to have a system for your life. For all intensive teaching purposes today, I want to use system as an acronym. I want to use system as an acronym in order for you to regain your balance, in order for you to find your fortitude, for you to start life all over again. Please write this down. It's just one word I want you to write down, and that one word is system. I want every person in this room, would you declare out loud, you have to have a system. You all are not up yet. Would you say it out loud? You have to have a system. Here is the system that you have to have going into the new year. System, as I already told you, is an acronym. And system, ladies and gentlemen, stands for save yourself. Stress, time, energy, and money. You just missed that. Save yourself. Stress, time, energy, and money. One more time for the slow class. Save yourself. Stress, time, energy, and money. Many of you are not going to be able to rebound. Why? You have no system. You are expending stress on people who are at ease. My sister, Dr. Tamer Brian Davis, clinical psychologist at Pepperdine University, says that 83% of our stress is not ours. We stressed about somebody else. You fasting and they eating. You praying and they at the movies. Y'all ain't talking back to me. Save yourself some stress. Save yourself some time. There's some energy you should not, in fact, be expending. Here it is. You cannot parent grown people. God, God, I can't hear nobody in here. You, you cannot coach people who don't have a teachable spirit. You cannot keep expanding yourself to somebody who doesn't want to learn. Save yourself some money. Stop buying stuff you don't need to impress folk you don't like. You, you kind of keep up with the Joneses and your own last name is Jones. You, 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 you got to figure out how in the words of Shakespeare to my own self can I be true. Save, save yourself. This is getting me get tight. A lot of you are not going to appreciate it. But God told me to tell you in this season of your life, give yourself permission to be selfish. You've been doing everything for everybody else at the cost of self-care. So you're doing everything trying to make sure they're okay, but you are falling apart at the hinges because you won't rest, you won't find any peace, you're not eating right. God says in this season of your life, sit down somewhere and do something for you. You understand you are not their savior. You can't die for them. All you can do is hope they live. 
save save yourself God says in this season of your life as I am setting the reset button I am giving you the opportunity to live beyond stress hallelujah you cannot have stress and faith at the same time when you got faith you understand my God is awesome he can do anything but fail and so while other people are losing their mind you able to say I'm staying calm because you don't know who my God is as a matter of fact I tried him and this is what I found out about him he may not come when I want him to come but he is an on time God there are a whole lot of people that got let off let go this year a lot of people who lost their house this year a lot of people who lost their car this year a whole lot of people that lost their mind this year but if you can hear my voice God told me to tell you I ain't done with you because I'm always saving the best for last and something great is getting ready to happen in your life amassing ladies and gentlemen amassing more wealth than Michael Marvin or Donald Trump and while Solomon is lauded as the wisest man who ever lived, the reality is the Old Testament figure of Job was worth his weight in gold. And while many people want the patience of Job, nobody has ever considered, hear this, the prosperity of Job. I want us, if we can, to do a diagnostic analysis on what it is that Job held in his financial portfolio. Keep your Bibles open. I want to show you something. I just want to look at one verse. It's Job chapter 1, verse number 3. Job chapter 1, verse number 3. Job chapter 1, verse number 3. Watch what it says. It says in verse number 2 that Job is upright. Here it is. He's got seven sons. He's got three daughters. And he has an undying devotion for the divine in the book that bears his name we now open up his portfolio and we find an inventory of what he has we discover here it is that Job has in verse number three seven thousand sheep do you see it in your Bible he's got seven thousand sheep he's got three thousand camel not only does he have 3,000 camel, he has 500 yoke of oxen. Don't take my word for it. Look at what your Bible says. He's got 500 female donkeys. But not only that, it says in the King James Version, he has an extended household. Now, as urban dwellers, it becomes hard for us to digest because when we look at verse number three from a casting glance view, it would appear to us that Job just has a farm. Uh, but that is not true. That is not true. When you look at it, here it is. He's got 3,000 camel. Now, you do understand that camels do not produce milk. Camels, here it is, are not edible. So what is it that Job is using the camels for? In, watch this, in ancient Palestine tradition, camels were transportation. I'm getting ready to show you something. Camels are transportation. So in essence, Job has 3,000 cars. All right, y'all are missing it here. Now, Jay Leno, Jay Leno, the late night talk show host, has a hundred. 145. Ralph Lauren has 217. There is nobody on the planet that has 3,000 cars. Now, if you think that is expensive, what kind of garage do you put them in? All right, let me see if I can help you here. Some of you, and I don't want to offend you, don't even understand, you've got a camel anointing. What do you mean a camel anointing, Pastor? A camel was used for transportation, hear me, because it could go far distances carry heavy weight and not need a lot of support and some of you ought to be shouting right now because you know you've come a long way you've carried some heavy weight and you didn't have a whole lot of support and when you should have broke down you just kept moving because you know the hand of God was on your life so watch this, he's got 3,000 modes of transportation. Watch this, transportation, very clear, is something that's going to take you somewhere. 
Now, if in fact there are 365 days in the year, even if Job drove a different camel every day, three different camels, he still couldn't ride them all. God told me to tell those of you who are bursting with ideas. God told me to tell you, pick one idea. And if you pick one idea you want to ride, I'm going to help you get that idea to drive you into your place of destiny. Some of y'all can't shout because you're only thinking about one thing. But those of you who got a new idea every morning, God said if you pick which idea you want me to bless, that's the idea I'm going to use for your next season. Now, these 3,000 camels by themselves don't seem that significant. But look right there in the verse. I'm still in verse number 3, Job chapter 1. He's got 700 sheep. 7,000 sheep. He's got 7,000 sheep. Now, if he's got 7,000 sheep, watch this. 7,000 sheep, that means, watch this, he's got a lot of wool. All right. Now, if he's got a lot of wool, he's got a lot of cloth. All right. So what that suggests to us, ladies and gentlemen, is that Joe was in the fashion business. So he's in the fashion business because he's got a lot of cloth and a lot of wool. Here it is. But he needs the camel because he's an independent distributor. So he needs the camels to take the cloth into Africa, Asia, and China because he understands what I produce is too big for where I live. But God is anointing me for a multilateral international corporation some of you you're dreaming too small what God has put on your life is bigger than Baltimore the people around here ain't ready for your level of gifting but God said get your passport ready because the anointing on your life is so heavy that I'm going to stretch you around the world look at your neighbor say I can tell he ain't preaching to you because you ain't ready to go nowhere but those of you who know in 2014 God is going to take my gift around the world the anointing on my life is going to be called for because there is an assignment so he's uh, he's got uh, he's got 7,000 sheep but not only does he have 7,000 sheep he's got 500 oxen I'm in Job chapter 1 verse number 3 here it is and the oxen can be used uh, as UPS trucks all right. See, the camels are good for long distances, but you need the oxen just to go close. Uh, all right. Uh, because here it is. He understood that the oxen had two different purposes. It can take me somewhere close, but it can also be used as a sacrifice. Some of you are never going to get to the next level. Why? Because you eat your profit. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. You, you, you got to understand there's got to be something that I give for sacrifice. Something is wrong with a believer who has a problem giving. Mm. Because how do you expect God to do something for you when you got a problem giving something to him? There ought to be something in your spirit that says, God, thank you for what you've already given to me. But because I know you're the giver of every good and every perfect gift, I got to give something back to you. So he's got 500 oxen. Not only does he have 500 oxen, but watch this. He's got 500 she-asses. 500 donkeys. Uh, now this is critical uh, because these are used for uh, enterprise rental cars. Okay. Uh, uh, now... The oxen are used for UPS trucks because they're bigger. Uh, the camels, watch this, for international trade. Uh, but I use uh, the she oxen, I use the she donkeys, watch this, just for rental trucks. All right. uh, now, there's a significant difference uh, between the responsibility of the oxen and the she donkeys. Okay, because the oxen, watch this, the oxen is only good to carry stuff. The she donkeys are constructed to carry people. Okay, y'all are still lost. So, uh, Jesus is getting ready to go into Jerusalem. It's Palm Sunday. He sends the disciples and says, bring to me two she donkeys. 
I'm getting ready to ride them into my victory. Y'all don't even understand. The anointing on your life is not even for you. God, help me. God is getting ready to bless you to be a blessing to somebody who's got to get somewhere. But because you're so self-absorbed and so selfish, you don't want to see nobody else get to the next level. So you cord everything that you have. But God says, I'm looking for people who will be a blessing. All right, uh, I'm losing you. Uh, I'm losing the crowd. Let me see if I can help you. Uh, so Jesus sends the disciples. Send the disciples. Watch this. And watch what he says. He says, borrow them. He says, borrow them. Watch this. There is no transaction of finance. He says, borrow the she axes. Bring them to me. I don't even want to keep them. I just need to make this ride and I'll return it. All right, let me see if I can help you. So nowhere in the narrative going into the triumphal entry into Jerusalem for Palm Sunday do we ever meet the owner of the she asses. He don't even make them sign a contract. Why? Because the owner understands his role. <laughs> Some of y'all get me miss it. Only 800 of you getting ready to jump in it. Here it is. He understood my position is biblical. What you mean, Rev? My position is biblical. Why? Because I'm a lender. God, I can't hear nobody. Some of you, God is getting ready to set up. Hallelujah. That when people are in trouble, all they're going to say is find so and so. Because the reputation they have is they are a lender. Now, the only way you can be a lender is if you don't owe nobody nothing. And I need those of you who believe by faith in this season of my life. I don't want to owe nobody nothing. I want to be a lender. I, I, I want to be above and not beneath. Hallelujah. Be seated. My time is almost up. Uh, I, I guess this is a good place for me to tell you um, before you shout, before you get excited and taken away in, uh, in emotionalism, before you can qualify to start all over again. Yes, um, Job lost all those oxen. He lost all those sheep. Oh, God, help me in here. He, he lost all those camels. But God really didn't get his attention until there was an attack on his children. God, I, I got the wrong crowd in here. And I'm, I'm talking to those of you in this room. I did this year, your greatest struggle, your greatest fight has not been about real estate. Your greatest fight has been about how can I save my child? Hallelujah. The enemy been trying to wipe your child out. He's been trying to get to your son and to your daughter. You don't even recognize what they've been going through this year. They've morphed into another personality. But I came to tell you, if you can hear my voice, the enemy's time is up. Whatever he thought he was going to do to your son and daughter, he should have did it before you got to church. I think this is a good place for me to tell you. And in that last day, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Here come my Bible reader. And your sons and your daughters will prophesy. The reason why the enemy trying to chill your child, he know there's a prophecy over your child's life. There is an anointing. Huh. Hallelujah. She can be seated, please. Be seated. Hallelujah. I feel something in this room. Look at your neighbor. Tell them the enemy is mad because my child is anointed. While they were still in their mother's womb, there was an anointing on my child. And I speak to the very powers of hell. No weapon that is formed against my child shall be able to prosper. Hi, yeah, yeah. Woo. Hey. Hey. Woo. Hey. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
hallelujah be seated please this is only just for 500 parents that been stressed about your child worried about your child God said if you give me glory the attack is over if you give me glory the assault against your child has come to an end Be seated, please. Please be seated. Hallelujah. 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 Y'all forgive us. We got spectators. But if this been a challenging year for your children, but you believe they're coming out of this because the gates of hell shall not prevail against them. I need you to lift up your voice. Y'all get ready to miss it. God said the attack wasn't even about your child. The attack was to see what would you do when your child is under attack. Would you get stressed out or would you still trust God? Hallelujah. Be seated, please. Hallelujah. Be seated, please. Be seated, please, right where you are. Hallelujah. 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 The enemy's been attacking your child's mind. Hallelujah. I'm waiting on my worshipers. He's he's been attacking your child's vision, your child's self-esteem. For some of you, your children been having physical health challenges. But God said this morning, I'm breaking the arm of the enemy. Touch not my anointed. Do my servant. No harm. Be seated, please. Please be seated. Job was like, okay, um, I can handle losing the house I am. Money can come, money can go. I can, I can deal with that. I, I really thought I was up next to get this raise. You know? But God, you let the enemy... Attack my child. That, that wasn't even in the agreement. This, this was just supposed to be me and you. You told the devil, mess with him. My kids wasn't in that. When the enemy knows you're anointed, God help me. When you got a hedge fence of protection. Because the enemy can't get to you. The next best thing is to get to your child. God, I can't find any worshipers. But I, I, I need some believers in this room who know by faith there's a hedge fence of protection that God is putting around my child. What you mean, Pastor? This is only for 80 real parents. I'm giving God glory. Watch this. That whatever happened to me in my life will never happen to my child. Whatever I had to live through, I'll never have my child indoor. Be seated. My time is up. I'm sorry. I'm Job lose everything. Lost his child to gangs. Lost, lost his daughter to the streets. Lost his son to the wrong crowd. Lost his daughter to addiction. Lost his son to dropping out of school. Lost his daughter for falling in love with the wrong Negro. Lost everything. And ladies and gentlemen, I wish it was a little bit easier. My time is up. But what happens when you lose it? And after you lose it, God goes silent. I could make it if he talked me through it. But God, I need some real worshipers. What? When I'm trying to figure it out, that ain't when I need God to shut up. That's when I need him to talk. 
I need some real people who this year you've lived through seasons man, where you prayed but you ain't hear nothing. God, I can't hear nobody. And I, I know even at the risk of being called heretical by other pastors, you tithed and you were still broke. God, help me. You, you were trying to be the bigger person, but you kept getting slapped in the face. You, you kept trying to make it work. And every time you made progress, it was something pulling you back. Invited friends over and friends gave me bad advice. Tried to make me feel like it was my fault. Like I wasn't an adequate parent. Like I didn't have enough faith. Like it was something wrong with my spiritual connection. And for days, for weeks, for months, Job didn't hear anything. And God didn't say anything. It got so bad that he's anointed and slipped into depression. I know you're going to sit in here with your church clothes on and act like there ain't been a season this year that you had to fight through depression. God, I can't hear nobody. Well, you, you ain't had money for no therapy. You had to be your own life coach. You, God, I can't hear nobody. There was some months you don't even know how you came through it. There, Some days the folk around here don't know. You were scared to pieces whether the lights would be on, whether there would be a roof over your head. You don't know how you made it this year. And God says, uh, Job, you ain't really broken yet. Job, you ain't really broken yet. Because you done lost all that. And all you see is you. And we get to Job 42. And, and Job does something crazy. He, um, he the one that lost everything. But let me... Let me show you how crazy Joe Wick is. He, he done lost his kids, his camels, his oxen, his sheep, his business, his retirement. Now watch crazy Joe. He, he starts praying for his friends. And his friends didn't even lose half of what he lost. Would you just touch somebody around and tell them I'm praying for you. I'm... I'm praying for you. Come on, touch them. Tell them, I pray you don't lose like I lost. I pray you don't go through the lack I had to endure. I, I pray that you're blessed going in and coming out. I pray that God will exceed. <laughs> 